you know, since the story of the French Revolution, comparing today to the French Revolution, I'm like, oh, I really want to read that. Nope. Just two of us feeling. Three of us, I'm sorry, two of you. Tomorrow, Monday, I will have a different CD charge. I try to keep things as much close as possible, but you know, eight is just packed. So today's the day. Okay, so a couple things here really quick. We got uh, oh, another list of all the DOI students. So every day I put this up, and if what we're doing, usually I do it after school yeah. the day before. If I put a bunch of information, if I put a bunch of links on there, so I hope you've seen this, to you know, the writing tips, practice outline, you know, a bunch of stuff on how to write a DBQ, go back through it again. You already have this material, but I just put it up there just in case. And two things. First off, or three things, I'm sorry. I am going to assign chapter 23. It's a short chapter on culture and society of the 1920s. And there'll be basically kind of one of those kind of half matching, half multiple choice quizzes on Thursday. But we'll be to do it in class. I'm actually kind of excited. We could do a quick, quick quiz in class. Are you as excited as I am? It'll be directly from the bookmark. So I put that right there. In fact, do you want yours now, or do you want it? Or do you want to wait till Monday? And all get it together. I'm giving yours now. No, yours. And. It's a, it's a short job. And don't forget the DBQ. Uh, I put down by Friday to read that material, but into the next week. But have it ready in case you have any questions, so I want you to think about it. And don't and focus on the different groups during the ratification battle. In the United States Senate, there were the, the reservationists, the irreconcilables. Sometimes they're called the loyalists, sometimes they're called supporters of Wilson. But there are three groups. And they have different views towards the Treaty of Versailles. So elements of the Treaty of Versailles they opposed or want or support it. By the way, geez, we're writing a five paragraph essay. That's almost three paragraphs, isn't it? And you do have to mention the vote itself because it's about the ratification. It did not get ratified. And you must organize for a full essay, five paragraphs, three body paragraphs, but you're only going to write four in class because of time. So that's we're good on that. Okay. So, oh, one more thing, Boys and Girls State. So Boys and Girls State, I'm putting it up there. I know I talked about it in other classes, but this hybrid thing, it's, I forget what classes I've talked about it to and everything else. But Boys and Girls State, it's a great opportunity um, for you to learn a little bit about, are we recording this? Are we good? Yep. It's a, uh, it's, it's a basically a place where you can go learn about civics, about government, and especially if you're interested in that, which I think you should be, because that will affect every moment of your life. Um, it's a good thing to look into for juniors from all over the state. So one week it's boys, one week it's girls. I think girls have finals week. Or here, it just happens to be. But they can work that out. So they come from all over the state. They go to, now it's in Helena. Uh, when I was in school, it was in Dillon, it was a Western, now it's all Ontario. And hopefully we can do it. But uh, so they have everyone from all over the state come together, and they do things like a lot city government, county government, state government, you go around the bills, you can city, all kinds of stuff like that. And then they have a bunch of activities, and there are speakers and things like that. 
So it's really a, a good, a great opportunity, but also, let's be honest, it looks good on Earth. It's really good on that. So you have to look pra practically too, pragmatically too. But if you're interested in that, look into it. I went to Boy State many years ago when I was at Western Montana College. And it was okay. I will tell you this. Well, just something to think about. Go back and look at it. Also, put that material if you're interested. All right. So, uh, pa, 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 where are we at here? So we're on, we're recording, let's get out of here. Social unit. This is right where we put yesterday, isn't it? Didn't we get to yeah, we touched on the, the propaganda committee? Who was the leader of the Bolsheviks that took over the October Revolution, took over Russia? Who was that leader? Lenin. Yeah, that's Lenin. And the Bolsheviks, you know, they promised a great, or this socialist workers paradise, we will make it here. But it turned into a pretty horrific uh, totalitarian dictatorship. And what was the treaty that they pulled out of the war? They pulled out of the war. Germany got a huge victory in World War I in the East. Brest yeah, Brest Litovsk. Right about here. Now just Brest, the capital of uh, Belarus. And massive victory. And most, oh, the reason the United States adopted total war, they went all in, was because of protests to what? What did people protest that Wilson thought must be pro-German fear? Or actually, fear of the protest, pro-German. Do you have that? Why well, they did a Creole commission. Anti yeah, anti-draft. Anti-selective service. So let's get the social unit. Social unit, the Creole commission, this is propaganda. And so remember, propaganda tried to get a certain point of view. It's not necessarily lying, but by definition, it is. Okay, let me break that. What they say might not be 100% true or 100% false. So it's not, it's not always lying in the material, but it's by definition dishonest. They're trying to mislead you, they're trying to leave certain things out to get you to, put, um, to believe a certain point of view. And what they wanted was they wanted to convince Americans to convince them to not just support the war, but to root out those opposed to the war. They wanted to drum up fear that the, if they don't succeed, the Germans or somebody else will win, and therefore we got to root them out. Sure, countries can pass laws to ban freedom of speech, but the best way is to get the majority of people, or just enough of them, so wild up that not only will they voluntarily be quiet and support this, but they will tell on or even attack people who disagree. And they have a, they have a name for it, war madness. And it's going to happen in virtually every war, the fight between them. And so they would do things like, here's a movie that George Creel was a movie producer. So he used that new art to make these really cheesy propaganda movies, Four Flags, Italy, Britain, France, US, all fighting for freedom. They also sent these speakers out, uh, they, they spoke for four minutes. Quick little patriot or nationalistic speeches, you know, support the war, never quit fighting, and what we have here, okay. By the way, you know this, it's Minuteman, remember the Revolutionary War, so very clever use of that. <laughs> and they go into schools, they go into workplaces, uh, just the same knowledge you would send out, you know, a video, you know, same kind of thing. And they were really effective. You know, we must do this. We must all be together. Anybody who's opposed is different and a threat, a traitor. And then at the same time, they pass the espionage. Act. This would shut people up because nobody wants to go to jail. And this would get the final hammer. If public pressure pressure from your neighbors, etc., or even family members won't shut up anti-war opposition, then we can arrest you. The Espionage Act would be first. An even more strict bill against speaking out against government would pass in 1918 called the Sedition Act. Do you remember, we have this in our past, the Alien and Sedition Act would be passed in 1898 during the Quasar War of France and had a virtual constitutional threat. 
basically saying you can't criticize the government. Don't forget, they're not going to arrest a lot of people, but it will shut most opposition down. And who are the targets? Anybody who had uh, germ, uh, German immigrants and, and immigrants who are ethnically German was, were the largest group of immigrants coming into the United States after the Civil War. Actually, after 1840, were people of German ancestry, including some of my ancestors, not the Partridges, you know, they're English, but Germans. And so just by having a German last name, made you questionable. Remember when I talked about genocide and how looking for dissent within they could be an enemy by who they are? A similar kind of thing is going to happen here, but not to that extreme. Doesn't mean it, it won't happen. And the other one was because of the communist revolution, the, both, the October revolution, socialists. Socialists, because socialists were opposed to the war. They saw it was workers killing workers, so the bankers and the financiers and the capitalists could get rich. And don't forget that idea that the Germans might be drumming up a revolution. So the fight for social unity. And propaganda would be used. Let me show you a few more posters. I love this one. This idea for a step into place. I just like this poster because it shows the attitude that comes in war, but also how you can get to totalitarianism. Here we have all these civilians, mostly men, there's a few women, but it's mostly men. And you notice they just blend right into soldiers. And now they become, you see any individuals at all? You leave your individuality behind and you become one of a mass. And this is what people want in war. You want everyone unified for war, which you're leading the country in war is. You can understand that logic, but this is where you get totalitarian states. In fact, Hitler would call it Ein Volk, one people, the mass. Now, Mussolini would say the mass will. We'll see this over and over again, acting like you're fighting for war. And yes, the brush for conformity here will be elements of that. Here are three more. First off, this artist clearly had a crush on this model. There are about 50 posters he made with her in it. It's all the same one, just slightly different, but it's all her. And same artist. And this plays on one more important element of it. A lot of this really overemphasizes this idea of masculinity. It's manly to go to war. It's manly to sacrifice. So here it's implying you're not a real man. If she would join, but you won't. So the G, I wish I were a man, I'll have that one up there. That one is just a, it just kind of makes me laugh. But these ones aren't even subtle. I want you. I want you. If you want it, but without pushing that, but it's basically uh, uh, she'll date you. Yeah, that, that's what it's telling young men. It's kind of, um, And by the way, that was what young men were supposed to want in 1917. And it just really plays on that. So you're not a real man. And she will laugh at you if you don't. That is a huge push for young men. I think we're all men, especially then. And the big thing is then hate, they drop the hate of all of the potential enemies, not just the Germans or to a lesser degree, the degree the Austrians or we never really got into a whole lot of Bulgarian thing or Ottoman thing. But here, hate works in many ways. So this is telling US soldiers to enlist. And you notice? A woman drowning, meeting a U-boat attack. Remember the Lusitania? Okay, that was two years before the U.S. entered the war. So the Lusitania did not cause the U.S. to enter, but it was one of many events. And so they're talking about the Lusitania all the time when the U.S. entered. And remember Belgium? This is 1918. Remember Belgium. And we know that's German. They wanted to make sure that the old style helmet. But more importantly, it's not subtle, is it? We know exactly what their client's going to happen now. They don't even say it. We know. Fear. Hate. And here's the thing. They did a lot of horrible things in Belgium. They did sink without warning. But then they exaggerated, embellished it. 
The enemy is evil. Can we allow them to win? And this would trigger war madness. And war madness, they were looking out for potential enemies now. And this poster would help. This was don't stop. The web is spun for you with invisible threads. Implying if you know anything that might help the war effort, there are German spies listening. It's implying that there are German spies all over. That means there could be German spies in our classroom. They could be at home. It could be your family. It could be at work. Now, there were very few German spies. The point is, anyone could be an enemy. And couldn't anyone be a German spy? What would a German spy look like? Like one of us. So, the root is out. You would have all kinds of things. First off, you got to indoctrinate them young. So here's a little kid with the held up to the Kaiser. Let's be clear about this. That's the parents doing this. The kid did not, hey, I'm going to write the hell of the Kaiser sign. No, that's the parents. And most of the time you see little kids do things like that, or anything, that's the parents doing it. It's not necessarily good, it's not necessarily bad. But that's what happens. And here, look at these German atrocities. Real poster. Sauerkraut. Ludwurst, blood sausage, Limburger cheese, frankfurters, or of course, I like dogs, but not this food. And so this would have kind of, it seems almost kind of funny. They would start doing things like calling sauerkraut, you had to call it victory cabbage. Or uh, dachshunds, victory pops. Frankfurters became hot dogs. Hamburgers became Salisbury steak. We're not going to use German names. And looking back, that sounds just kind of crazy, but let's be clear about what happens. What happens is, therefore, this idea that not everything German is evil. Thousands of dachshunds would be killed. People would go to their neighbors and have a dachshund and they'd hang. Why? Why do you have a German dog? You're a traitor. That's war madness. There are vigilante groups, American Liberty League, groups like that, that would go around. They became thousands of them, including the local, usually local police forces, and they would attack people with German names. They'd throw rocks through the windows, I mean, sometimes even to burn their house down, jump up in the middle of the street and beat the hell out of them. So my great-great-grandfather on my mom's side, so their, their uh, family name was Schutz. That was my mom's uh, maiden name. No, I'm sorry, that's, uh, that was my mom's uh, uh, maiden name. And he had a little, little shop. So pretty big grocery stores, you know, in the 1920s, teens, 20s, generally have a grocery store, you have little shops, because if you don't have a refrigeration or a car, you can't really have a big grocery store. Once you have that, all the little ones will have a business. Monopolies and companies and scale. They got talked about, they're all coming. But anyway, they had a little shop, and it was Schutz. That's what he called it, Schutz. Schutz is a very, very German name. And he had that front window broken so many times they lost half. And people would go into the store and just start like, knocking on shelves and throwing stuff and stealing stuff all the time. And the top of people went into the store. Why? German name. A lot of Germans, like a lot of Schmitz, changed their name to Smith. So they wouldn't be attacking me. Now, my great grandfather was pretty pig headed, so he never changed his name. But that, that's what people went through. That's war madness. And the thing about it is, is that you look at it and think, that's crazy. And then, of course, we would never do that again. We would never do that today. Of course we would. So when were you born? 2004? So this is still going on in your lifetime. So starting in 2003, when the United States invaded Iraq, France did not join. France wanted nothing to do with us, one of our closest allies. France said, this is crazy. Iraq does not have weapons of mass destruction, they're not a major threat, and the war would turn into a quiet war. And boy, were they completely right. Worse than they, th than, uh, than they thought it turned out to be. But, so there's a lot of anti-French feeling in that first year that the, before the U.S. went to war and then the year in Iraq. A lot of anti-French feeling. You know, they've let us down. And so a lot of places, um, you know, quit, like stores quit having French wine and things like that. And a lot of restaurants including 
the cafeteria for the United States House of Representatives. And this had to be done by a vote on the floor of the U.S. House. It's their rules. The House did this. They voted to change the name of French fries to freedom fries and French toast to freedom toast. Now, this is not just some story. No, this was, they passed a resolution that the House cafeteria must do this. And a lot of places follow. In fact, the state of Montana, I'm pointing to the Capitol. It's about that direction, isn't it? Pretty close. So Montana has a bunch of investment for like their pension fund for teachers and state workers, and they invest in the stock market. They divested, meaning they quit, they sold all their stocks of companies that had uh, um, that were French or French subsidiaries, like Michelin Tire. And because we're, you know, we'll show the French. By the way, the state of Montana lost about $15 million because of this. But that's war madness. So it's still going on in your lifetime. The bitter attack on the French, which is just kind of mind boggling. And it's happening now. There are thousands of examples of Asian Americans being attacked right now because of the coronavirus. Say it is, you know, this flu from China. That's one of the reasons why they don't want to use a country name for that because of the garbage about saying, I just want China caused it. And it's happening right now. They're being attacked. Especially in you know, bigger cities, you go to places where there's a lot of, of Asian American immigrants. But I know what's happening here. Hell on. I know what's happening. That's the same thing. So if you think, oh, we would never do that. No, it's surprising how many people would actually kind of get a kick out of that. We have a lot of jerks in this world. Not in here, out there, right? None of you online. We're good people. So, with that, so political prisoners be arrested. Montana passed their own espionage act. Over 200 Montanans would be elected. And this man right here, these are three people that were arrested in the state of Montana. So, Clintonstein, just, I, I just took this effort to give you an idea what people were arrested for. He was arrested and sentenced to four to 10 years. Read what he said. And by the way, the police didn't find him. Somebody told on him. Four bags. Imagine going to jail for 10 years. That was seen as traitorous talk. He would end up serving a little over a year, which is still an incredibly long time. So that's what was going on. It happened in World War II, but not as much uh, to regular citizens because we were attacked and Germany declared war. But it happened to Japanese Americans, and you can see it. So no group was attacked more outside of German Saudi name than socialists who were opposed to the war. There's a labor union that was created at the turn of the last century called the IWW, the International Workers of the World, or the Wobblers. And for reasons I can't explain, I forgot a B. There's two Bs here. I forgot a B. I'm sorry. You know why I miss that? So I went to use for this, I used kind of a Deutsch font, you know, German font. It marks every word in spelled wrong. I have no idea why. Like, do they expect me to be writing in, in German? And so it just marks everything wrong. So sometimes I just I ignore you know, the little zigzag lines underneath. I ignore it. And I, I know it's a bunch of typos that I didn't even look at. I know. They're the successors to the Knights of Labor. They wanted the one big union. Their symbol was Sabo Cat. And they were they, they were great at organizing and rallying people up, but they weren't very good at like the day-to-day -day activities of the union, like getting the contract. Their symbol was Sabo Cat. And I like Sabo Cat, so there's Sabo Cat. And they were accused of being social or being pro German because they were against the war. Here is a poster for the IWW. Now, this is propaganda, so it's more complex than this, but there's certainly elements of truth here. So here's a worker, so he's cultivating the tree of death. But all the money goes when, like, a will be dug up later for you know, this is a banker or the business owner or somebody like that it's a little awkward but that's what it's saying you know, the roots go to him and so they're opposed to the war and by the way yeah there's a major element of truth to this the banks start pushing for war to get their money back 
Here, though, is the Kaiser, and instead of the nose, it's I, mustache is W, mouth is W. Implying that the IWW is really up front for the Kaiser. And so a town like, let me throw a town out here that was big with the IWW. Let me think, let me think. Oh, Butte, America. Butte was booming. Wobblies were everywhere. <laughs> Frank Little was an IWW organizer. And he went to go speak to the miners, and Butte was over 90,000 people in 1917. You can imagine how copper was in such demand, especially now that the war was going on. By 1919, there'd be 120,000 people. That's why Butte is such an amazing place. It's this big ghost town. Well, vigilantes, along with the Butte police, warned him. The American Liberty League came out and said, we will not allow you to speak. And they put this symbol out here, and this actually was on his, well, his body, 3777. And what they did is, after he gave this rip roaring speech to thousands of miners, other people who were for the war and the police went to his hotel room afterwards, drug him out, beat him senseless, tied him to the back bumper of a car, drove through virtually every street in street Butte, and then hung him from that railway truss. So they lynched him. Lynching is torturing somebody to death. We usually think of it as hanging. And so many times it would happen to African Americans, you usually thought that that way, but it happened to people with, with different political points of view. And so he'd be murdered. Nobody would be arrested. And on his body, it said, under take notice, first and last warning, 3777. And that is the dimensions of a grave. Maybe. We're not 100% sure, but we think so. And this refers to a group called in Montana history, the vigilantes I mentioned them once before, and they would use this as a warning to those they wanted to attack. And lots of people think that they were vigilantes for law and order. No, they were vigilantes because they were attacking people who were pro-union. The vigilant union as in the Civil War, I mean like the Union, the United States. The original vigilantes in Montana were pro-Confederate thugs. They almost certainly murdered the uh, Territorial Governor of Montana, Thomas Francis Moore. Remember him, I mentioned from Antietam and the statues in front of them, which was a real slap in the face of the vigilantes. So that's why they put that on. And it's always so awkward that our state police, called National, we call the Highway Patrol here in Montana, have this. It's like, really? Are you sure? But it's kind of all this tradition. And the tradition is so strong, there's a vigilante parade which I don't think necessarily should be a pro-Confederate thing, but that's kind of what it is. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to be co-chair for the vigilante court. And I hate vigilantes. Don't ask, it just kind of happened. Oh, and what's East Helena's um, mascot? No way! So it's that. So this is going to go all the way to the Supreme Court. Can the Espionage Act, and then the Sedition Act, this is about the Espionage Act, can the government ban free speech? The court case is Schimp versus the United States. Schimp was a, a socialist. And, oh my goodness, I misspelled the espionage. <laughs> I, <laughs> the SPI. That was the technical term. That's the legal term. I think you understand. This is law. <laughs> I didn't even know. No one said me. The SPI. I got. All right. So. It went, can the government ban free speech? Because remember, the First Amendment to the Constitution says there can be no laws passed that infringe on the freedom of speech. But it doesn't mean you have freedom of speech. All it says, I can't pass a law shutting you up. And the Supreme Court agreed. The Espionage Act was constitutional. It says speech can be limited if it's a clear and present danger. By the way, it's really hard to define clear and present danger. So that's a big loophole, isn't it? And the example given is one I've mentioned before, back when I talked about the Bill of Rights. It said that you cannot yell fire in a crowded theater because you, would th you think it would be fun to watch the panic. So that is their definition. So what they're saying is opposition to the political decision to go to war is the equivalent of yelling fire in a crowded theater. 
But to this point of view, it's saying that it's destabilizing the government. So there are a number of people out there still protesting, and then once this happens, there'll be a wave of arrests, including a significant number of women. And this is right outside the White House. And they are protesting the fact that Wilson promised to fight for suffrage and was not doing it. He promised to fight for the right to vote. And I think this is pretty, and they're protesting the Espionage Act, because women who protested the right to vote, who protested for the right to vote, were being arrested under the Sedition and the Espionage Act. The, def- the reason why? By going against the government, regardless of the issue, helps the enemy. But the big one you have to get down is Eugene Debs. I thought this would be bigger. I'm going to put that on there. But remember Debs, the socialist head of the American Railway Union, or the former strike? Debs was always opposed to this war, workers killing workers, he said. And he was arrested for speaking out against the draft. And at his trial, he refused to participate, saying this is a farce and un American. Yet, this is his final statement. And I put this up for his statement because he lays out the fact that he will not quit. Not, he will not quit. And so he talks about lower class and the criminal element in the soul in prison. He's talking about two different things. The criminal element, he's talking about political prisoners. So he's not talking about somebody who uh, committing you know, robbery or fraud or something. And the soul in prison, do you remember when I talked about the 13th Amendment? how they would arrest blacks and make them basically slave laborers after the Civil War. That's what he's talking about. And I will not shut up. And so, this is a but that his supporters wore in 1920, a year after the war. He ran from pr- for prison. This cartoon's about it, too. Did I say ran for prison? Ran for president while sitting in a federal prison in Atlanta, Georgia, and got a million votes. And so Debs was probably one of the most popular Americans. Um, but then also some people absolutely despised him because of his opposition to the war and his stance for unions. And so with that, well, so if we gather that, um, we talked a little bit about women right there. Women, a significant number of women happen all over the war into the workplace. Men go off to fight, they had to take over jobs on the farm. Or here on the left, for example, they're welding, but this is probably a publicity polo. Actually, no, they're, they're riveting. Riveting is a little bit easier than welding. Let me rephrase that. Riveting is less hard than welding. Riveting is really hard, too. But women taking over the jobs of men. But right after the war, they lost those jobs. There would even be more in World War II. And the same thing would happen. But it's no doubt that women entering the workforce in World War I even though we're still considered uh, not equal citizens, would help push for and promote suffrage, the fight to vote. And we've talked about this before. We've come back to it. The progressive said they're going to fight for it. Wilson said he was for suffrage in 1912. He said it again when he ran for election in 1916. And yet he didn't fight for it. Congress has got to have passed an amendment by two-thirds of the vote, and then it goes to three-quarters of the states. And in 1917, it was languishing in Congress. You, a lot of people, especially men, but some women, told leaders of the suffrage movement, we're at war. Wait till the war is over. And they refused. By the way, they used Wilson's word against, words against it. If this is a fight for democracy, then we should have the right to vote. And so they went outside the White House, or every place where Wilson went and never quit fighting. And they forced Wilson to react. A good way to look at it is they made Wilson incredibly uncomfortable. Change does not happen unless you make those in charge feel the heat. This person right here and here, her name was Alice Paul. And more than any other single person, her leadership would lead to the 19th Amendment. The Susan B. Anthony Amendment. Wilson finally had to, a good way to look at it is, it quit ignoring it. And it got through this House and the Senate, and then Tennessee was the last state. 
Montana allowed women to vote in 1914, so Montana passed this really uh, very early. Montana was a very progressive state back then. And workers, a lot of workers, small farmers. But you know, this is a pretty, this is a pretty amazing statement to make. And by any definition, violated the Espionage and Sedition Act. And she refused to back down. So in the process of getting this elected, part of what happened was she there is there she is in prison. By the way, she was knitting a, a flag in prison, in every state that ratified it, she put a stop. Um, that flag's out in Washington, DC. It's really cool. But in 1918, when it looked like it stalled, and Wilson once again said, ah, the war is over, we have to wait till after the war. She went on a hunger strike. And this is a drawing of what happened to her. They force fed women who went on hunger strikes. The same thing happened in Britain, the suffragettes. And when I say force fed, this is a torture. This is by definition torture. And they did it in such a way to cause extreme pain. Not just to torture them, but also to deter other people from doing it. So they would take a steel. No one took pictures of this. It was so awful, traumatic for everything. Mean, just awful what they did. They took a steel tube that had a curve at the end and it was kind of pointed, and they jammed it down their nose. So they would take it, they would feed this tube, so it's not flexible, and they would feed it down their nose, it would stick down in there. So yes, it would rip apart your sinuses and it would connect to your throat. And then they would dump this mixture of raw eggs, milk, and flour, and just dump it down their nose. And they would gag and rag, these choking in their own blood. And this was a horrific torture. And those were the political prisoners and how they're being treated. And that's here. That's the United States. And so, it's a, um, but they got the right to vote. Prohibition also came about this time. And prohibition, remember we talked about temperance and how drinking, a lot of people were more and more opposed to drinking because what it was doing to families, but also they wanted good workers or the control. The progressives were kind of both. And the progressives portrayed this as a wartime measure. Wartime measure. And what they said is a couple fold thing. First off, Germans were. Um, Germans were especially well known for like uh, lager beer. And a lot of the brewers in the United States were Germans. Or at least they thought they were Germans, like uh, Miller was a German, a few others, Coors was a German, Budweiser, uh, there was Falstaff. There's a bunch of breweries, most of them are gone now. Pap, there was a, they're all Germans. So they're saying the Hun Beer Association. You're helping the Germans. But not only that, you're wasting grain. Grain that could go for bread for the soldiers or fodder for horses and you're making booze. That's helping the wartime effort. So a number of states, like this was in Washington state, they begin to push prohibition measures in their own state, saying uh, banning, banning booze will help the soldiers at the front. In fact, the state of, or the United States banned the production of beer in 1918. And then kind of this wave of Unity, the war is over. In 1919, the amendment was passed, the 18th Amendment, which allowed for the prohibition of alcohol. Now, this is going to be kind of tough because states are going to have to pass it too because it's just going to be really tough to enforce. There's no federal police force. They need the cooperation of states. There's going to be a lot of holes in it. But all of this would never happen without the war. And then the Volstead Act would be signed, and that would enforce it. And to enforce it, the way they get it is this. The 16th Amendment allows for an income tax and the federal government can tax anyways. So they put a huge tax on, on alcohol. They put a thousand percent tax on the sale of alcohol. So what that means is, let's say you're a store and you sell a dollar's worth of, of alcohol, of booze. You have to pay a $10 tax. You go out of business really quick. But the federal government can enforce that through the Treasury Department. So Treasury agents would work with local police 
to find people who are selling booze and avoiding the tax. And that's how they enforce it. And it was pretty clear anybody selling booze was avoiding the tax. By the way, somebody who makes or smuggles alcohol to avoid the tax is called a booze. That's where that term comes from. And this is the uh, this would be the beginnings of you combine looking out for spies and then alcohol. These treasury agents were government workers, and they called them G-men. And this is the basis of what's going to become the FBI in the 1930s. And so that is uh, that's a prohibition paper. Would not have happened without the law. I can't imagine it happening. And alcohol consumption went down by about a third. Most people don't like to break laws. But we'll talk a little bit more about this later. Let's get to a flu. Also, a horrific flu. Sorry. Well, it's probably a virus. Uh, we had this in 1975 called the swine flu. Probably the night it pops up. But well over 600,000, and maybe as many as a million Americans died. In a country with a population of about 100 million, this was a catastrophe. And uh, we're talking about a world, this was a worldwide pandemic. And everyone says that the idea was, okay, there's a 100-year pandemic. And I remember a couple of years talking about this, the 100-year pandemic. And they go, 100 years, huh? Oh, as we were in the house talking about our pandemic. Uh, eventually, more people died of this than the war. But the war is what spread. More people were moving about the country or the world. There's more trade. And that's why it spread so quickly. And we should remind us of our current pandemic. It's not as deadly. About 20% of the people who caught the Spanish flu died of this. Uh, this flu is anywhere, or this virus is not flu, I'm sorry. This virus, 1.5 to 2.5% of people who catch it die. And it's different than this. Uh, our, our current pandemic, mostly elderly people are the most vulnerable. Here are younger people, your age. Your immune system would react so hard that you would go into shock. So you were, would have been much more at risk than me. I would get sick. I could have too, but about 20%. Oh, it didn't happen to me. It started in Kansas. But nobody talked about it because there was a little war going on and there was censorship. All right, so we'll finish this tomorrow, aka Monday. We'll all be here. Aren't you excited? Kind of? I'm, I'm worried, even though the number of cases going down, but it's some variant of my cousin and Fred. But at the same time, it would be nice to have a little class and, you know. And let me see my CD charts. I think I have them. All right, uh, I have to go up and see. It's about time. It's Norman's class. What class? Who's class? Uh, for accounting. I have to do some stuff. Okay. Well, you have a nice weekend. And you do on Monday. That's our chart. That's the seating chart. Yeah, there's a lot of students in here. Not used to that. So you're gonna be pretty close to where you're at. Yeah, I'm just like, well, have a nice weekend. We'll see ya.
Wars never end. Back for more? I know where it's at. I've driven by that.
But anyways, more people than ever before. We'll see ya. Let me know how it goes. Let me know how the, the rally goes. I'll be back. Don't break anything. You get the whole room yourself. Isn't that awesome?
come back, just cause any trouble, didn't break anything. Darn it. Oh, teaching preferences. They send us a thing. What do we want to teach next year? They don't look at it, but they act like it. That's why I've been here long enough. And I put down what I've been teaching for. <laughs> Have a good weekend. We'll see you. Oh, Monday. Are you excited to be here on a Monday? Yeah. In the, um, what's it called? Is it The Impossible? It's about the tsunami in Thailand. Yeah. In that movie, he's actually 15 and he looks like me. <laughs> you know why they do that, right? Well, yeah, because so they look older. Live more than that movie, right? Not particularly. It's actually because they want to work with actors that are just a little bit older and they have been doing that since like the start of the film industry. So this point, it's actually kind of psychological. If you see an eight-year-old in the movie versus an eight-year-old in real life, don't think the eight-year-old in the movie is close to four. Because we've been trained to essentially think a couple years down when we're over the screen. Then they won't let you beat children anymore on the movie stuff. That's true. You got the wrong line! Oh, and there's... I only wish I... I'm actually not really joking. <laughs> there's also going to be five fantastic pieces of, like, prequels. Oh, goodness. Well, because like Harry Potter is born in like um, 1980. He's born in Montana too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm a big expert on that. So okay, born and so they're gonna go like before 1980. But no, this is um, like it follows New Scamander, and it starts in like the 30s. So, but like the first movie takes place in 